I, I think, Peter and Dave, it's only fair that we give you an opportunity, you know, reflecting on the conversation that we've had about disruption this afternoon. What stands out for you when we talk about disruption and the leadership roles that both of you play in this issue? What do you believe is absolutely critical to bringing an idea to life and disrupting things? Well, my takeaways and my experiences with disruption and listening to Richard is he makes it sound very easy, but the reality, <laughs> the reality is dealing with disruption is difficult. It's really difficult. We are, after all, human, and humans are resistant to change. And when you think about disruption coming at you, not only from within the business, from outside the business, collaterally, from changes in other industries, it's really difficult to deal with. And, you know, my takeaways from... The, all the things that I've heard are you have to, first of all, do something. Mm. You can't be the, the deer with the headlights and just ignore, uh, ignore it. You have to do something. But rather than try and change the world uh, all at once, much as Richard does, uh, you have to do it in bite-sized chunks and make a plan and, and, and tackle it. And, and so it's, it's difficult. Uh, but we can all have, do it. We are doing it here in our, uh, our, our industries in Canada and I'm very proud of that. And Dave, your business, I mean, the banking and financial services industry isn't necessarily renowned for its disruption, but I know at ATB, you're, but you are, you're, you're an organisation that's got a totally different reputation. How have you driven that disruption within your own organisation? You know, I think to the point uh, Peter just made, the hardest thing is to listen. You know, you get on a roll, you think you're, you know it, and it just, even though you started out listening, it, you start listening to yourself instead of your customers and the other mm. people in your organization. And I think that takes a constant kind of looking in the mirror to make sure uh, we're hearing uh, from our own organization and our customers. And I think the other point that Richard made, uh, we always think of disruption and new breakthroughs in, in kind of the business world. Mm -hmm. And I think in the world uh, going forward, we have way too, we're asking governments to do way too much stuff and we got business really working uh, there and, and I think the disruption in the nonprofit sector, it's just as difficult uh, to run kind of a world leading edge uh, nonprofit organization and I think if you had those three legs of the stool, government doing the right thing, business doing the right thing and nonprofits with real capacity and innovation, that I think is a super strong society. Must be music to your ears, Susan, hearing people say we need to get more listening happening. Yeah. <laughs> Encouraging? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, it's funny. I, I, well, I was struck by many of the stories that Richard told, um, but maybe especially the one where you were talking about um, talking with the, the, the flight attendants where the shoes were rubbing against their heels and feeling like, okay, we've actually got to get on that. But then the next day having new shoes for them. Um, I, I was just struck by the idea of, wow, if there were that might, degree might of listening. might have been a day or two later. Like, <laughs> 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 at least we started. <laughs> but yeah, but you know, that, that uh, bringing that ethos to business and making that part of the mainstream, I think is quite disruptive. Now, I want to make mention as well, we're going to open it up to questions. So if you aren't already tweeting in, what an incredible opportunity you've got with these four on stage to ask any question you want around the topic of disruption. I wanted to ask all four of you, whoever would like to contribute, the role of leaders in disruption. You know, what are the core elements that we need? When we think about the capacity and skills that those of us in the room can really work on building, honing, developing in ourselves, what's critical to being a leader through this period of disruption and being the ones that are doing the disrupting, not being disrupted? Whoever would like to yeah, go? I guess, you know, I, I think it's harnessing uh, the talent, is, you know, letting people know where you're trying to go, give them an idea of what their role is in it, and then just give them the very best tools uh, that you can. I, I think sometimes people see themselves or they act more like a manager than a leader. And I think some of the proudest days, you know, of anybody's uh, career as a leader is when an organization thinks of things you couldn't possibly have thought of yourself. Mm. And, and I know that's a great feeling when it, it comes along, and I think that's from just getting everybody pointed in the right direction, giving them great tools and uh, letting them go. Yeah, well, Dave, I, I think you're being very modest because I view you as a great leader, <laughs> honestly. And um, the leader's job, especially in disruption, is to set the rally cry, the culture of wanting to succeed. I think, Richard, I got that out of your vignettes as well that you showed. I mean, if you don't have that tone in your organization, 
then navigating through disruption and succeeding is very difficult. Yeah, I'm sorry, you've heard from me, so I'm not going to talk too much. But, um, no, we had, we had a lovely lady on um, uh, Necker Island um, who sort of came as an oil magnate, and, and um, we had a sort of three-day sort of really good uh, discussion, and she left um, wanting to come and uh, transform, transform the oil industry. Um, and... Uh, and made a really good go at it, go at it a, a, um, a woman called Suzanne West. And, um, and yeah, they, she was honored earlier today. Um, <laughs> and, um, uh, and I think that uh, in, in, in herself, uh, she, you know, she has not transformed the industry, but, but, but she's definitely, I think, spearheaded the industry in, in, into rethinking. Yep. And, and uh, the industry is trying to think, you know, how can we, how can we save 20% carbon output, you know, at the oil wells? How can we, you know, how can we, how can we save ourselves money and save 20% output, you know, and so on. And, and just, uh, and she, and, and so I think that her legacy, I think, will, will be, will, will, you know, will have made a very big mark here in this, in mm. this region. And, and, and I think that could spill over into many other places around the world. Peter, did you want to jump in? I just want to say, I think another word that comes to mind is inspiration, mm. you know, providing inspiration for people to rally around a noble cause that we all know is worthy for our generation, our children, and beyond. So. Susan, we've spoken a lot about risk this afternoon, particularly risk, yep. the conversation around risk-taking and the importance of risk and its place in innovation and disruption. But I've, I've heard you say before that we need not just our risk takers, but our heed takers just as much now, if, if not a, a more than ever before. Can you explain a little bit about what you mean when you say that? Yeah, um, it's that we, we're, we're living through a cultural moment right now that rightly, to some extent, um, lionizes the idea of risk taking. Um, but when you have untrammeled risk taking, that's when you get into trouble. And so we need to make sure that we're creating cultures where um, the people who are naturally risk takers and the people who are naturally heed takers are respecting each other and talking with each other. Because what, what you find often, you know, when you look into the histories of you know, banks that failed in 2008 or um, a situation like an Enron, you often find people who were kind of the natural heed takers who were who are trying to put the brakes on, um, but not necessarily being listened to or their voice is not being honored by the people in charge. And so that's a, that's a cultural shift that I think is very key. Others comment on the role of risk taking and the balance that we potentially need with that when we're thinking through disruption? Well, uh, sorry, uh, no, I'm just gonna say, prote I mean, protecting the downside is, it, you know, is critical. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I mean, when, when, um, when we got that, one seven four seven all those years ago from Boeing, um, that you know that potentially put you know we had a very successful record label that put the whole record label at risk. Um, but the key to that part of the deal w was a clause which Boeing agreed to, which which was that we could hand that plane back at the end of the first year if I'd got the my judgment wrong about um, there being a, a, a demand for a good airline. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, um, and, and as it was at the end of the first year, it worked out, so we, we got another two planes from them. But if it hadn't worked out, we weren't, we weren't going to bankrupt mm. everything we, 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 we'd done. So, um, so all the time, you've just got to think, well, what's the worst thing that can happen? Uh, make sure that we, you know, we, we can, we, we've got that covered. Dave, did you want to add? Yeah, you know, there's an awful lot of talk about diversity uh, these days, but you know, I think one of the best risk management tools is diversity. Mm. Um, you know, the worst board of directors for a bank ever would be 12 bankers. You know, because you, you, you can just like lemmings off into the sea. Um, but uh, so, so that, you know, I think protecting the downside is what comes when people are thinking from a different direction. Uh, we're getting flooded with questions, so I'm watching these come through, you know, every second. Interesting question from um, Strad Consulting. Do you need to shift culture before you disrupt, or does the disruption itself shift culture? Thoughts? That sounds like a Peter answer. He's, he's got the brains. <laughs> <laughs> and the shoes. Oh, he does too. I hadn't even noticed. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is a disruption conference. <laughs> True. Sorry, I, 
No, uh, what were we talking about? The <laughs> Do you need to shift oh, culture yeah, 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 yeah. Well, you know, to mean, disrupt I mean, or the other way around? Well, disruption will come at your organization and you have to be very introspective. And if your culture is not fit for adapting going forward, I mean, you have to, you have to change your culture. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think yeah, there, there, are, there are some companies, I mean, the, interestingly, the reason that um, I find that most people leave uh, companies is not, not actually because they're not being paid enough, um, it's because they're not being li listened enough. Mm. Um, so, you know, if, if someone's got a great idea in a company and, and they've get, they're given no chance to put it into practice or they just, you know, uh, you know they, they, they just have people saying no all the time, mm. they're going to quit and they're going to go and either do it themselves or, they, or, you know, what you want is a company full of entrepreneurs mm. uh, who, who love working for, a, 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 you know, for, for you but uh, they are entrepreneurs effectively working, working within a bigger company. Yeah, I, I think that, well, I know that we are in an environment, especially in the world of energy, yep. where we are being disrupted from multiple angles. And, you know, th this is not going to end anytime soon. Mm. Like, disruption is now a way of life. So your culture has to be one of inspiration. Your culture has to be one, I would argue, excitement if you want to attract the next generation of people into the business. And, and, and I think what I see happening certainly in our Canadian oil and gas industry is that the sentiment is starting to shift of one of where we can be part of the solution, where we can rejuvenate excitement uh, as, we, as we go forward and try and address some of these biggest issues that humanity faces, mm -hmm. whether it's climate change or uh, other issues of sustainability. I think it's definitely culture. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, uh, you know, the Marconi mm -hmm. vacuum tube company, you know, we still think transistors are a bunch of crap, you know, and that shitty sound. <laughs> this is good sound out of this mic. The shitty's good. <laughs> poor, poor sound. You know, so, so if you have a company that, uh, you know, doesn't listen to those ideas, mm -hmm. and I think Richard, you know, you could prove it with hockey players these days, you know, somebody making $6 million a year they're not getting any ice time and they're unhappy. Mm. I'm thinking, sit down, shut up, cash the check. Uh, <laughs> but they're unhappy because they're not being appreciated. And yeah. It's the same way in our companies. Uh, I'm starting to wonder about your culture. <laughs> yeah, I, I gotta, I... Susan, there's a question coming through, kind of building on your comment about Enron and those lone voices trying to speak up against the tide. Conrad's asked, when you notice stagnation in the workplace or you know challenge to the culture, how does one initiate disruption if if you're a solo voice? How do you get yourself heard? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. And um, the answer is you're never a solo voice. You really aren't. So you should be thinking really day to day for all the different ideas that you have that you think are really important and need to get advanced. Who are my allies here? Um, who else feels this way? Who's a kindred spirit? Um, and, and together, you can build to get your ideas out. Um, there, there are all kinds of interesting studies that find that if you're in a meeting, let's say, and you have one person who's the dissenter, they're much less likely to be listened to. But if you have only two people who offer the dissenting voice, then the chances of those ideas being taken seriously um, increase exponentially. Mm. So there's a lot of work that you can be doing behind the scenes to make that happen. Others? I mean, do you, do you see a lot of not invented here syndrome type stuff? Like if somebody from outside comes in, is that better? In terms uh, of the acceptance it can, of it? Yeah. it can be, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that at all. I, I think it's more just a question of strength in numbers and, and remembering that the numbers don't have to be that big. Um, but I also think that it, it needs to come from the top up. I mean, you need to have, I'm sorry, from the top down. Uh, you need to have leaders who are putting in place systems where you're always encouraging dissenting views. And, you know, you can build that structurally into your meetings by saying, okay, who, who wants to take the devil's advocate position here and really showing that you're respecting that position? I've got another question. I would attribute it to the person who's asked it, but their name is actually just an emoji of avocado and bread. So Avocado Toast has a question for you. Um, the question is, seems like keys to leadership and disruptive transformation are authenticity and empathy. What would be the third key for each member of the panel? You can disagree, but authenticity and empathy... If there was a third key to disruption, what would you say it was? Question for anyone. I'm, I'm hopeless at these sort of games. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I, go ahead. 
I don't know if a trust is the same as authenticity, but you, 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 you know, to, to do well in that world, you, you, there's an awful lot of trust. You have to get the right mm. people around you. You have to be able to you know, get them so you trust uh, what they're doing. Not necessarily the individual ideas. You're not trying to pick through those, but you're kind of trusting the ecosystem and their caliber of their thought and things like that. So I'd add trust. Yeah, I, I think integrity is critical yeah. uh, in a culture. In, 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 again, inspiring the people around you. Yes, it's and if uh, avocado and toast wants a suggestion, I would add tomatoes and rock salt. <laughs> well played. I see what you did there. I like that. <laughs> Susan, anything to add? Yeah, I'm going to suggest something that it, it kind of overlaps with authenticity, but it's slightly different, and, and that is um, encouraging people to operate from a sense of deep conviction. Um, because what you find is that some pe sometimes people don't actually know what they think, and if you're not sure what you think, it becomes really hard to act on it and to disrupt on it. But, but developing convictions is a muscle just like any other that you can build up over time. Um, so you can work with your people to, sh to show them uh, you know, okay, what's your opinion on this? What do you really think about this? And then encourage them to speak from that very deep place. I, I think one more word is enthusiasm. Uh, enthusiasm is infectious. Mm -hmm. right? it, it's, and, and positive enthusiasm is really infectious in an organization. And uh, I'm sure you sense that, Richard, in, in all the fantastical shots, whether it's the, the galactic or otherwise. Yeah, 100%. I think also with disruption, the, you know, r rather than a company being worried about other people coming and disrupting the company, um, uh, you know, think how you can disrupt, how, I mean, right, think how somebody could come and disrupt you mm -hmm. and, then, uh, and then jump in there yourself. You know, and so, I mean, in the oil and gas industry, um, rather than waiting for the clean energy industry to come and disrupt you, um, and you know, and solar is now cheaper than coal. Uh, you know, wind is now cheaper than coal and, and oil. Um, not that, not cheaper than natural gas necessarily yet. Um, but you know, just come get in there and 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 um, join jo join in the, the, the clean energy revolution. And um, I mean, in in our you know, with, with the, when the record shops were under a, 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 a attack when people weren't buying music anymore. Uh, because they were buying mobile phones mm. and um, video games and other things, we thought, screw it, we'll start video, we'll start going into mobile phones, we'll start going into video games, and we, you know, we, we protected the company by doing that, and I think the, 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 the oil industry should do the same. You just touched on the energy sector. We've got a question from Robin on uh, the energy sector in, in Canada. Might throw it to the locals first, but feel free anyone to comment. Uh, given all the positive things happening in the Canadian energy industry, do we need a rebrand? If so, where does that start? Well, I think rebranding is happening subtly. I, I think more effort needs to put into it. But look, uh, as, as, as Richard just alluded to, when you are under assault, there are two things you can do. One, improve your processes to lower your costs, and two, improve your product. In the world of oil and gas, improving your product means making it lower carbon, lower emissions, uh, more sustainable, lower water usage, and all those sorts of dimensions. So it's really important for our industry now to demonstrate that we are doing so with measurable. And the good news is, is the new technologies that are emerging, sensors and blockchain and all these sorts of technologies that are emerging that we will be able to monitor and demonstrate actually that we are making dramatic gains in this business. And I think once we can actually back it up and demonstrate it, the rebranding will happen very quickly. Dave? Yeah, and I, we need to be less defensive. Like we, we need to stop defending oil and gas, that it's the only fuel that could be a, a fuel and expand to energy. And when you think about it, um, you know, as a, as a province or a country of Canada that needs to find new energy sources going forward, we've got like a royal flush. We, we have great universities, we've got great people, and we've got all kinds of fossil fuels that are under the ground that can be monetized to turn into new energy sources. So, so when you think about starting an energy sources, it's not limited by anything except brains and ingenuity. And so 
with the fossil fuels, we just have to take that, turn it into brains and ingenuity, and we'll be the energy capital of the world, not just known for our fossil fuels. Yeah, if I could add one more thing. I mean, if, in terms of the branding, um, so Richard, when he gave his uh, comments earlier, you, you mentioned the tar sands. And so tar sands actually is an example of branding, a negative branding, frankly. And by the way, it comes from the 18th century when one of your compatriots from the UK, Alexander Mackenzie, first came over here, stuck a pole in the ground and said, oh yeah, this stuff's tar sands. So um, I can tell you that, um, uh, you know, over the course of the last 10 years, over the course of the last 10 years, we have so been I disrupted. You, I expect he's related yeah. to a lot of you as well in this room. <laughs> So over the past 10 years, you know, I can tell you we have felt disruption, whether it's uh, uh, tar sands, which is now oil sands, and I think in the future, as Dave said, it's probably just going to be called energy or oil, um, all the way down the spectrum from the heavy oils, light oils, medium oils, condensates, et cetera, all the way to natural gas. And uh, I am really confident that if we pick up on the themes of this really important conference here, mm. which really seeks to raise awareness, and I really commend Graham and the organizers. Um, it is critically important that we all have that enthusiasm to demonstrate to the world that we have moved beyond that pole in the ground and that we are actually part of the solution of the future and we are true leaders in making this planet a better place. That's all. We've got a couple of really phenomenal questions coming through from some of the students and student organisations in the room. One from Student Energy. Uh, Dave, they pick up on your idea of the three-legged stool, uh, NGOs, government and business, uh, being necessary to move innovation forward. Question is, how do we leverage our NGOs to create the capacity necessary to deliver large-scale impact? You know, a couple of ways. One is, which I think we're doing, is more and more people coming out of universities, coming out of business, are interested in working for NGOs. So I, mm -hmm. I think, and it's not that they're, they just bring a different skill set to an NGO. They think differently, uh, and I think that broadens it uh, for sure. I think the other thing is, you know, banks, you know, we're Luddites in, in kind of a way, and we're slow to pick things up. But I think we're starting to see uh, NGOs as really just as sophisticated as running a business. And so, uh, you know, what Henry Ford invented was the car loan. It was more important than the car. He wouldn't have sold any cars unless he had invented the car loan. Um, and so banks, I think, can start to mobilize uh, NGOs by seeing them as something that responsibly, you know, we can provide leverage to. That's what businesses do. They mm -hmm. raise capital and then they borrow money to expand their businesses, buying airplanes. And so it allows you to do things. And I, I think nonprofits sometimes have a cash only mentality. I can do with what grant I got or I can do with what cash I've got. And, and I think as financial institutions start to see their ability to raise a stream of revenue, you know, it's just the same as a company is able to sell a product. I think you can start to prove that to an NGO. So I think that will really provide a leg up combined with the human talent that's going in. So social impact bonds and those sort of new financial instruments almost? There's lots of opportunities yep. to think of different ways and think of ways that we can finance these NGOs. Richard, lessons from Virgin Unite in terms of getting scale and capacity out of social enterprise and NGOs? I, I think so, social impact bonds uh, is uh, a tremendous in sort of incentive to try to get, um, you know, to, to you know, solve, solve the solve problems. I mean, at Virgin, uh, so I've slightly gone off tack, but I mean, just something which I, I thought is worth just mentioning. We, we, we have a policy of trying to take on as many ex-convicts uh, as possible. Now, uh, companies could actually be given a social impact bond to take on ex-convicts uh, who don't re-offend. Um, we've got, I suspect, 250 ex-convicts working for Virgin. Ex-convicts wow. are horrible work, but anyway, 250 people who've, uh, who've slipped up uh, working for Virgin. <laughs> Said um, shit into a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, 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 and not one of them have re-offended. I mean, they've been, wow. given, they've been given the dignity of work, um, and, you know, we've actually got 
you know, one, one, one woman who comes out from prison on a Monday morning, comes to work with us, goes back to prison on a Friday night, who's brilliant. We've got a, 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 another person who's head of security at our, one of, one, <laughs> one of our, one of our, one of, one of our other that. companies. Um, and, um, uh, and uh, yeah, um, but, you know, with social impact bonds, you can actually, you, you can, you can, you, your government can actually work out, you know, all that, you know, right, okay, reoffending, it's costing the country, um, it's right. costing the country a lot of money, reoffending, uh, courts, police, uh, society. Um, so let's, you know, let, let, let's, um, you know, let's maybe give a little bit of some, some money or help companies taking on ex-convicts. And you can, you can do this with so many different areas of society and, and, and get on top of a lot of problems that way. I've got a question coming through from Luke. Uh, having been given the opportunity to attend through one of the institutes of technology today, I was wondering what advice you would give to students who are trying to disrupt. Any thoughts? Early stage disruptors, what advice would we give? Screw it, just do it, get on with it. <laughs> <laughs> That's been a very consistent mantra, I like that one. If you haven't written that down, you should. <laughs> No, I mean, I think, um, yes, yeah, students, um, yeah, I mean, the, you know, I think actually if you haven't really started thinking about disrupting really quite young, you know, 15, 16, it's, it's unlikely you're, you're going to be able to start doing it later on in life. The earlier, the earlier you start, you know, creating a business or, you know, the earlier you start coming up with sort of entrepreneurial ideas, the better. And, um, you know, particularly in the tech world. And, and um, uh, and, and, you know, I was, yeah, I remember my headmaster said, you know, what on earth are you wanting to do run a ma running a magazine? Um, uh, you can either, you know, stay at school and do your homework, you know, do your schoolwork, or you have to leave school and run your magazine. And, you know, I said, thank you, I'm off. Um, but, um, but, you know, the, the, a cleverer head, headmaster would have said, you know, wonderful, you know, do the magazine in the school. Yeah, maybe I can just reframe that just slightly because it's a really important question but from the perspective of organizations mm -hmm. that are bringing in young people I, I think that organizations which sometimes have the stodgy culture that don't want to change I think the imperative is on them the senior management who typically have uh, gray hairs like some of us on stage <laughs> and uh, to listen to them to, to listen hard we talked about listening earlier and it's, it's just imperative that if you want to regenerate, rejuvenate, uh, have that enthusiasm in your organization, you have to bring the young people in. Thoughts, Susan? Yeah, I, I would also say, like, in ter from the perspective of making sure that you are in the, the correct individual and emotionally healthy state of mind in which to be as dis disruptive as you possibly can be, it's good to be paying attention to making sure you're you've got equilibrium in your life. By which I mean, if you're gonna be super creative and disruptive in, in one area, absolutely go for it and make sure that, you're, that you've got solidity in the other areas. Like you've really gotta you know, make sure that you're eating right and sleeping right and all these things that may seem like they're small, but they're actually the building blocks that allow you to go out there and, and, and do all this stuff. Um, you know, even, even something as incredibly unglamorous as thinking about what is my backup plan if this thing happens not to work, that just going through that step can then give you the peace of mind to go out there and take the big risk. You know, if that was a young person asking that question, it was, yep. you know, I think sometimes we all think we can change the world, but you got to get in a place that's wanting to change the world. So as Peter was saying, if you end up talking to a company that sounds like what Peter was saying, they don't want to change. Like, life's too short. Find the kid, somebody mentioned kindred souls. You know, mm -hmm. like, you are just batting your head against the wall. It's just a, a world of difference when you walk into a room and, you know, just like Richard said, somebody says, yeah, let's do that, instead of coming up with the 10 question, 10 ideas, I mean, reasons why it won't work. So, so I think there's, sometimes we get jobs and we think, oh, it's going to, it's hard to find another job, and, and it is, but it's also kind of wasting your life uh, mm. to be in a place that isn't listening uh, mm. to you. Yeah, listening has been a very strong theme throughout the day, actually. Uh, we don't have much time remaining, which is a shame because I feel like I could talk to this group of people for hours, and I'm sure you could all happily engage in the conversation too. I wanted to ask you, uh, we've got a room full of people who are here because the topic of disruption resonates with them. 
If you were to get them to head out today with a, a call to action or something you want to encourage them to take up and start doing tomorrow, think differently about, begin or move faster towards, what, what would be the call to action each of you would like to leave the room with? Dave, you look like you're ready to go. <laughs> I was wondering what Peter was going to say. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I, like this. I have a man crush on Peter, just for the record. <laughs> it's all right, I have a girl crush on Susan, so we're all good. Yeah. We, we, we'd, all, we'd all agreed earlier, I, I happened to have lunch with Peter earlier, and I, I, any, any, any questions on oil pipelines, any, 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 anything nasty, Handball. Peter's going to handle that one. <laughs> I'll take the bullet. <laughs> so in answer to the question, <laughs> Dave, what's the call to action? You know, I, I think one thing, um, we sit on our hands a lot, and I don't know if it's Canadians or, or just what, um, and I, I'm going to take your question a, a little bit, but, you know, we look what happened in the United States when they voted against something. Mm -hmm. They didn't know exactly what they got, uh, but they voted against something, and, and I think we need to, and, and those things kind of come from we're not very vocal on our opinions, so I, I think if we want to change things, we got to vote as consumers. Mm. Like stop buying the stuff that you, you kind of rail about, yet you go and buy this and that, and uh, and really have more of an opinion and be more outspoken. Like we're just, I don't know, it feels like we're being pawns to a bunch of people running a little political game or an economy or whatever, and, and we're not getting as much say as we can because we, we, we can change things with many voices, and I think as... Canadians, for sure, we need to be more vocal. Peter? Well, I think you have to walk into whatever organization you're in. I mean, we have all sorts of uh, different ages and different uh, disciplinary functions in, in the room today. But I, first of all, the call to action, no action is unacceptable. We know that. So the call to action really is to take a critical review of what it is that you can do to shake things up. And I, mean, I think it's just questioning whoever your superior is or your peers or however it was, can we do things better? Uh, is there something we can change? Assuredly there is. You know, I, I have been in sessions and meetings where I would ask, well, are you doing this? Or, oh yeah, we're doing that, we're fine. Mm. Right? Well, I, I guarantee you, you're not fine. Right? Things are changing and that the status quo is not acceptable and that w you have to put on your to-do list a series of items uh, that you think are potentially things that need to be questioned or need to be addressed. Right. Right. Susan? Um, I'm going to draw on a theme that has come up a, a bunch in this discussion, and that is the importance of looking for your kindred spirits in, mm. the, thing, in the places where you want to be disruptive. Look, there, it, it, it's impossible to overstate the impact of surrounding yourself with those people and what you can do together, especially now when everything is so ridiculously complex and it's just more than one person can do alone. But like, so what does that mean? I mean, that sounds really nice, but even in a, a, a conference like this, like you should be assigning yourselves the, the task of, of locating, let's say three kindred spirits here who you didn't know beforehand and making sure that you stay in touch with them. And if you do that in every interaction, every event that you find yourselves in, you're gonna have you know, quite a collection and it's gonna be pretty mighty um, 10 years in, let's say. Brilliant, Richard, call to action. Um, I think just, uh, uh, yeah, be interested in everything. Uh, um, you know, look for opportunities in, 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 in every, uh, you know, in every conversation you have with people, um, you know, uh, you know, just learn, learn, learn. Um, I mean, we, we were talking again at lunch about geothermal. Uh, you know, I think geothermal is the is 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 something that could be the next the next big breakthrough for large large swathes of the world, and and yet it's right in its infancy. Uh, there could well be people in this audience who could. Uh, you know, come up with the, break, the breakthrough to make geothermal, you know, the, 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 nec the next big thing. Um, but, uh, you know, but, but, but by, by the people out there just listening, learning, listening, learning, um, you know, they'll, they'll see an opportunity and then they should just gra grasp it with both hands and, and uh, get out there and enjoy it. Well, what wonderful advice to end on. We've got vote for something, not against something. Speak up. 
Take a critical review of what you can do. Question, aim for better. Find your kindred spirits in the space that you want to disrupt. And finally, be interested, look for opportunity, learn, learn, learn. I feel like we've been absolutely treated this afternoon. Could we all be upstanding and give a virgin, uh, give a thank you. <laughs> give a thank you. Give an energy disruptors thank you to Virgin CEO Richard Branson, ATB Chairman Dave Mowat, Peter Tertzakian and Susan Kane. What a wonderful group. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. Awesome. Thank you, Dave.